Section 19 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 10, Titus, A.D. 79-81. to Titus was born in the tiny cell of a poor house at Rome when his father was struggling on with straitened means. But when Vespasian caught the eye of the favorite Narcissus, and was sent to serve in the high command in Britain, his young son was taken to court to be brought up with Britannicus and share his pursuits as schoolfellow and playmate. His powers of mind and body ripened rapidly, and he gave promise of a brilliant future, till his early career at court was cut short by the murder of Britannicus. He was said even to have touched with his lips the poisoned cup, and to have long suffered from the potion. Little is told us of the years that followed, save that he served with credit in campaigns in Germany and Britain, and gave some time to legal studies, till his father took the command of the army in the Jewish war, and the prospects of civil strife opened a wider horizon to his ambitious hopes. The memories of his early years spent in the palace may well have fired his fancy, and his adventurous spirit probably outstripped the slow caution of Vespasian. It was Titus who intrigued with Mucianus, who went to and fro between Egypt, Palestine, and Syria, who plotted and schemed with Berenice in the intervals of gayer moods, who compromised his father's name and drove him to come forward as a candidate for empire. When all was won and Vespasian's strong hand was needed in the capital, Titus was left to close the war in Palestine and to pacify the East. The struggle dragged slowly on in spite of his impatience to return. His personal gallantry and skill in the conduct of the siege won the trust and affection of his soldiers, but his merciless cruelty to the conquered left a lasting stain upon his name. The winter months were spent by him with royal pomp in the great towns of Syria, where the eastern princes flocked to do him honor, and alarming rumors spread at Rome of the sovereign airs which he put on, of the ominous influence of Berenice, of his unbounded popularity with the army of the East. Men began to fear that he would not be content to wait and share the empire, but would rend it asunder in a parricidal war. Such fears were soon put to rest, when in early spring he left his train to follow as it could, and hurried with all speed to greet Vespasian with the simple words, See, father, here I am. From that time he shared in full the titles and reality of empire, assuming in his thirtieth year the tribunician dignity, which his father had till this time modestly declined, and dazzling Roman eyes with the pomp and magnificence of the triumphal shows. For Titus, felt perhaps that Vespasian's homely vulgarity was out of place in the founder of a new dynasty, and that to balance the traditions of the Caesars and the profusion of a Nero, it would be prudent for the new rulers to do something to make themselves admired or feared. He had himself a princely bearing and a ready flow of graceful words. He excelled in manly exercises and was a lover of the fine arts. He keenly felt the ridicule that clung to some of his father's ways of raising money and urged him to think more of appearances, but in this Vespasian was not to be moved. He even bantered Titus on his delicate nerves, asking if he disliked the smell of the coins that were paid as the impost on unsavory matter. But in other things he was more yielding. He was willing to follow the imperial traditions, and to spend largely on the great works which Titus raised to dignify the Flavian name or to eclipse the memory of Nero. The parks and woods included in the circuit of the Golden House were given back to their earlier uses, the palace itself was in part pulled down, and the baths of Titus swallowed up the rest, while the Temple of Peace was built to hold the works of art which had been stored within it. The bronze colossus of the emperor, founded for Nero by Xenodorus, was changed into a statue of the sun, and gave probably its name to the Flavian amphitheatre, which still survives in ruins. In after years a triumphal arch was planned and finished, on which we can still see the solemn pageant 
and note the great candlestick and other national trophies of which the temple at Jerusalem had been despoiled. Besides such tokens of imperial grandeur, Titus relied, it seems, on sterner action, but in this he took his measures without concert with his father. He had managed to win his consent to the death of Helvidius Priscus, but Vespasian would be no party to a reign of terror. His son took the unusual step of becoming prefect of the Praetorian Guards, an office filled commonly by knights. The soldiers were convenient agents, who asked no questions but acted at a word, and if anyone at Rome was too outspoken in his criticism or likely to be dangerous, he was easily removed in a hasty riot or a soldier's brawl, or a cry would be got up in the theatre, or in the camp and the traitors had be called for. In one case, it is true, treasonable letters were found to prove the guilt of a noble who was seized as he left the palace where he had been dining, but then it was remembered that Titus had a strange facility for copying handwriting, and boasted that he could have been a first-rate forger if he would. If it was his wish to inspire terror, he succeeded, for men already began to whisper to each other about his cruelty, and to fear that they would see another Nero on the throne. Still more unpopular were his relations with Berenice, which might end, it was thought, in marriage. Had she not already, like another Cleopatra, bound his fancy to her by her eastern spells? And would he not probably go on to seat the hated Jewish paramour upon his throne? The populace of Rome, which had borne with Caligula's mad antics and Nero's monstrous orgies, were stirred with inexplicable loathing at the thought. Titus tried to silence the outcry with harsh measures, and had one bold cavalier beaten with rods for a rude jest, but the storm grew louder. He saw at last that he must yield, and reluctantly consented to dismiss her. This was not all that men had to say against him. There were ugly stories of rapacious greed, of debauches carried far into the night, of sensual excesses better left unnamed. Such was his character at Rome when Vespasian's death left him sole occupant of the imperial office, and from that moment a change passed over the spirit of his life. Like Octavius, he had been feared. He would now, like Augustus, win his people's love. The boon companions that had shared his midnight parties, the unworthy favorites whose hands were tingling for the money-bags which Vespasian had filled, the informers who had tasted blood and thought the chief hindrance in their way had been removed by death, all these vanished at once, like birds of night when dawn has come, and were driven even from the city. He was full of tenderness and courtesy for every class, sanctioned by one stroke of the pen all the concessions made by earlier monarchs, and it was not a princely thing to let any suitor leave him in sadness with his boon ungranted, and complained that he had lost a day in which he blessed no man with a favor. So scrupulous was he of any show of greed that he would hardly receive the customary presents, so fearful of staining the sanctity of his reputation that he aimed at universal clemency, and pardoned two young conspirators with a graceful tenderness for their mother's anxious feelings, which made the mercy doubly precious. His father's strict economy had left the treasury full, and Titus could enjoy a while in safety the pleasure of giving freely and the luxury of being loved. For the people who had feared a tyrant thought that the golden age was come at last, and soon began to idolize a ruler who refused them nothing, who spoke with such a royal grace, and spent so freely on their pleasures. They did not ask if it could last, or if the revenue could bear the constant strain. They did not think that their ruler's character might change again when he had to face the trial of an empty treasury and a disappointed people. Happily, perhaps, for the memory of Titus, his career upon the throne was short. He had little more than two short years of absolute power when Rome heard with a genuine outburst of universal grief that its beloved ruler had caught a fever on his way to his villa on the Sabine Hills and died, complaining that it was hard to be robbed of life so soon 
when he had only a single crime upon his conscience. What that crime was, no one knew. Posterity, perhaps, might think that his one crime as sovereign was the leaving the legacy of empire to Domitian, his brother, whose vices he had clearly read and weakly pardoned. Some great disasters mark in sombre colours the annals of his rule. In all, he had shown for the sufferers unstinted sympathy and bounty. A great fire raged three days and nights through Rome. A terrible plague spread its ravages through Italy. And lastly, the world was startled by the horrors of a story so unparalleled in history as to tempt us to dwell longer on details. The volcanic energies had been slumbering for ages beneath Vesuvius, or had found a vent perhaps here and there in spots higher up along the coast that were full of horror to the ancients, but seem harmless now to modern eyes. A few years earlier they had given tokens of their power by shaking to the ground the buildings of Pompeii, a city peopled by industrious traders. The Roman Senate, warned by the disaster, thought of removing the city to a safer spot. But the Pompeians clung to their old neighborhood and repaired in haste their ruined dwellings. The old town was swept away with its distinctive Oscan features that told of times before Greeks or Romans set the local fashions, and a copy of the capital upon a humble scale, with forum, theatres, and temples took its place. Some of the well-to-do migrated probably to distant homes, and left their houses to be hastily annexed to those of neighbours who soon adapted them, though on different levels, to their own use. But scarcely was the work of restoration over when the great catastrophe came upon them. The little cloud that rests always on the mountain top expanded suddenly to unwonted size. The credulous fancy of Dion Cassius pictures to us phantom shapes of an unearthly grandeur, like the giants that the poets sing of, riding in the air before the startled eyes of men. But the younger Pliny, who was a distant eyewitness, describes the scene in simpler terms. He was with his uncle, the great naturalist, who was in command of the fleet then stationed at Mycenaeum. Suddenly they were called upon to note the unusual appearance of Vesuvius, where the cloud took to their eyes the form of an enormous pine tree. The elder Pliny, who never lost a chance of learning, resolved to start at once to study the new marvel and asked his nephew to go with him. But the young student, who even in later life cared more for books than nature, had a task to finish and declined to go. As the admiral was starting, he received pressing messages from friends at Stabiae, close beneath the mountain, to help them to take refuge on shipboard, as the way round by land was long to take under the fiery hail that was fast falling. The fleet neared the shore where the frightened families had piled their baggage ready to embark, but the hot ashes fell upon the decks, thicker and hotter every moment, and stranger still, the water seemed to retire from the beach and to grow too shallow to allow them to reach the poor fugitives, who strained their eyes only to see the ships move off, and with them seemingly all hope of succor. The volcanic force was doubtless raising the whole beach and making the sea recede before it, but Pliny was not to be discouraged, and landed finally at another point, where a friend had a villa on the coast. Here he bathed tranquilly and supped and slept till the hot showers threatened to block up the doors and the rocking earth loosened the walls within which they rested. So they made their way out onto the open beach with cushions bound upon their heads for shelter from the ashes and waited vainly for a fair wind to take them thence. Pliny lay down to rest beside the water while the sky was red with fire and the air loaded with sulfurous gases and when his slaves tried at last to lift him up, he rose only to fall and die. A.D. 79. By a curious irony of fortune, the student whose great work is a sort of encyclopedia of the knowledge which men had gathered about nature, chose the unhealthiest spot and the worst posture for his resting place, while his ignorant servants managed to escape. For the waves were charged with sulphur that escaped from the fissures of the rocks, and the heavy gas moving along the surface of the earth 
was most fatal to those who stooped the lowest meantime at pompeii the citizens first learned their danger as they were seated at the theatre and keeping holiday the lurid sky and falling showers drove them to their homes some hurried thither to seize their valuables and hastened to be gone out of the reach of further risk some felt the ground rock beneath them as they went and were crushed beneath the falling pillars others sought a refuge in their cellars and found the scoriae piled around their dwellings hot dust was wafted through every crevice noxious gases were spread around them and thus their hiding place became their tomb hour after hour the fiery showers fell and piled their heaps higher and higher over the doomed city while a pall of darkness was spread over the earth then the hot rain came pouring down as the sea waters finding their way through fissured rocks into the boiling mass were belched forth again in vapour which condensing fell in rain the rain mingling with the scoriae formed streams of mud which grew almost into torrents on the steep hillsides and poured through the streets of herculaneum choked up the houses as they passed then rose over the walls till an indistinguishable mass was left at last to hide the place where once a fair city stood weeks after when the volcano had spent its force some of the citizens of pompeii who had escaped came back to see the scene of desolation guessed as best they could the site of their old homes dug their way here and there through any hole which they could make into the rooms and carried off all the articles they prized and then they left the place for ever time after time since then the struggling forces have burst forth from the mountain and the volcanic showers have fallen and covered the old city with a thicker crust till all trace of it was lost to sight and memory after many centuries it was discovered by accident and the work of clearance has been slowly going forward constantly enriching the great museum at naples with stores to illustrate the industrial arts of ancient times and restoring to our eyes a perfectly unique example of the country town of classical antiquity in all its characteristic features at herculaneum there has been less done and there is more perhaps to be looked for it was a resort of fashion rather than a market town was more under greek influence and therefore had a higher taste for the fine arts than pompeii and above all it does not seem to have been rifled by its old inhabitants from whose eyes it was hidden probably by thick coats of hardened mud end of section nineteen